put on this computer. All right, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, this is a bit of a repeat of some previous lectures that I've done in the past, but I think it's really important information and it's um, good stuff for everybody to get a review on. Um, so I'll share my screen. Uh, let's see. Can I get a thumbs up if everybody can see that? All right, so um, please, please feel free to ask questions as we go um, through the chat. That's probably the best way to do it. And I'm just gonna make sure that everybody is on, uh, let's see, is on mute. Let's see, mute all. All righty. So, um, so the, the title of this lecture is A Chance to Cure saving lives and limbs in your patients with lumps. And that's the frame of mind that I want you guys to get into is a chance to cure. So with um, a lot of cancer surgery, we really have an opportunity to cure these patients of local disease. That's not to, not to say that they're not gonna spread systemically at some point, but at least as far as the local disease is concerned, I would say I probably cure about 99% of the patients that I do surgery on. And that is, um, reflects two things. One is that I'm a reasonably good cancer surgeon, but two, I choose my cases carefully. And so if I don't think I'm gonna get a cure, I'm, I'm less likely to take them into surgery in the first place. And so I wanna have those really good informed discussions with my clients to make sure that they know what they're getting into and what kind of surgery um, the pet is gonna be uh, having. So a couple of things, first definitions, as far as I'm concerned, and this is, I'm not sure this is completely consistent throughout all the veterinary literature, but as far as I'm concerned, recurrence implies another tumor of the same type in the same location, which usually implies that tumor cells were left behind at the previous surgery. Metastasis is another tumor of the, tumor of the same type in another location, which results from systemic spread. And that means that it has to invade into lymphatics or blood vessels, travel to another organ, and then reinvade lymphatics or blood, blood vessels to get either into the lymph node or lung or whatever, um, and then set up shop there, develop a blood supply and that kind of thing. And so metastasis is quite an involved uh, physiologic process or pathologic process that, um, that requires a lot of different steps along the way. And um, that's why, for example, the anti-angiogenic chemotherapy drugs work is by preventing the blood supply from forming in the new site. Um, remember that multiple primary mast cell tumors are not metastases. And so, especially if they're low-grade tumors, these are multiple spontaneous primary tumors that occur and do not imply high-grade or metastatic spread or anything like that. All right, so uh, look at these statements. If you ever hear yourself saying these things, I want you to really question whether you've done the right thing by the patient. And these should be real signals to you that maybe uh, maybe you need to reevaluate how that patient is being managed. I would have taken out more, but I was afraid that I couldn't close it. I got out as much as I could. I thought it was a lipoma. We got dirty margins. Let's hope it uh, doesn't come back. And so I want everybody to put in uh, uh, a yes if they've ever said that before. I know I have. So put in the chat, type yes if you've ever said any of these things before regarding a patient. Um, and for those of you that are not putting a yes in, um, I think you're fibbing <laughs> because everybody has, everybody does, I know I have. And so that should be a sign to you if you find, you know, you hear yourself saying these things that you need to really question whether you're doing the right thing by the patient, maybe reevaluate how you're managing um, uh, cancer in your patients. Um, sorry. Uh, so, I'm not sure why um, I'm getting these green lines on the screen. Hopefully they won't stay forever. Uh, so when I talk about cancer surgery, I talk about the 10 commandments or the 10 stage checklist that you wanna follow with every patient. And probably the most important step is that informed discussion and consent that you have with the owners. And what we wanna make sure is that the clients have all the information that they need in order to make the appropriate decision. And so those steps, and we'll go into each one in quite a bit more detail, but informed discussion and consent before you ever do anything. So when the patient presents, uh, performing a biopsy, doing a literature review, staging the patient, 
And then once we've had the biopsy literature review and staging, we'll have another discussion with the client to check in with them to make sure that they know what they're up for. Doing an appropriate surgery, if, if, uh, uh, if you're going to get a cure and you think that a, a curative surgery is possible, marking and assessing our surgical margins. Then once we get our histopath back from the pathologist, we want to have another informed discussion, consent with the owners about whether we need to follow up with any adjuvant treatment, what's the prognosis, is chemotherapy indicated, is further treatment if we got dirty margins, um, further treatment indicated, and then chemotherapy if it's appropriate. All right, so let's start with Maverick. Maverick is a five-year-old male neutered bull mastiff. Uh, Three-month history of a progressively enlarging mass on the left elbow, and he's otherwise healthy. All right, so informed discussion and consent. What are we going to talk about? So we've got this patient sitting here. What are we going to discuss with the client? Number one, what is the or what are the possible diagnoses here? And the other big question is, what is the worst case scenario? So with this mass, um, possible diagnoses. Um, you can put in the chat if you'd like. Um, what you would think about as a possible diagnosis here. Um, I would be thinking about a soft tissue sarcoma, maybe a mast cell tumor, it's over the elbow. So I suppose something like a synovial cell sarcoma is a possibility. Uh, so mast cell tumor, soft tissue sarcoma, synovial cell sarcoma, very, very different treatments and very different prognoses for those tumors, all right? so. Um, do we do an incisional biopsy first? And that's a question that I get frequently um, from referring vets um, and clients about whether we need to find out definitively what this thing is before we're gonna take it to surgery. So number one, what are the possible diagnoses? Number two, what's the worst case scenario that this could be? And then do we do an incisional biopsy first? Well, number one, will it change the treatment? If this was a grade one soft tissue sarcoma, is that gonna be a different uh, treatment than if it's a grade three mast cell tumor. You know, if it's a grade one soft tissue sarcoma compared to a synovial cell sarcoma, those are very different tumors that require very different treatments. For example, soft tissue sarcoma, you could just do a wide local excision, whereas synovial cell sarcoma, you have to amputate that leg. There's no, you know, no choice in the matter. The other question is, will it change the owner's willingness to treat? Well, grade one soft tissue sarcoma, we can cure most of them. Whereas with a grade three mast cell tumor, there's only about a 20% chance it's gonna be alive at the end of a year. So that may be one that the owners may not want to treat. Um, so uh, asking, basically what I do is I ask the owners, if we get a grade three mast cell tumor on this biopsy, are you gonna be pissed off at me for having done this surgery? Are you gonna regret having done this surgery? And if the answer to that is yes, then we need to do a biopsy first. And if they say, no, I just wanna do the best thing by my dog, uh, don't care what it costs, don't care what it is, I'm happy to do chemotherapy or whatever, then I'm happy to go ahead and go straight to surgery without doing a biopsy first. So no preoperative biopsy, what is the absolutely the worst tumor this is likely to be? Am I willing to administer a surgical treatment that will result in a local cure? So, and I want you to use that C word, cure. So we're not gonna do, we're not gonna shell it out, we're not gonna peel it out, we're gonna cure this patient of cancer. And are the owners willing to treat that worst case scenario? If the answer to both of those questions are, yes, I'm willing to do a surgery that's gonna cure it, even if it's worst case, and B, the owners are willing to treat that worst case scenario tumor, then go for it. Do a surgery that's gonna be curative intent um, and, and then see what happens when the smoke clears and the biopsy results come back. Whereas if either of those questions, the answer is no, you need to do a pre-surgical biopsy. So may, named must be your fear before banish it, you can. So the next stage is finding out what we're treating um, and that's doing a biopsy. Most mistakes in cancer surgery are made because of not resecting aggressively enough because of not knowing the diagnosis prior to excision. If you learn one thing from this entire lecture, it is this statement here. You can take a photo of it with your phone. Most mistakes in cancer surgery are made because of not resecting aggressively enough because of not knowing the diagnosis prior to excision. All right, so we often start off with cytology. So we're gonna do a fine needle aspirate. Um, and I, I often do that even if I'm going to do a biopsy just to find out, just to get a general idea in my own head what we're dealing with, also to improve my cytology skills so that if I've got a cytology and I've got a biopsy, I can compare the two, see how I'm doing. So in-house we can 
usually say that we can diagnose lipomas, mast cell tumors, and soft tissue sarcomas. Kind of generally, you might add osteosarcoma to the end of that list as well. All right, remember that with cytology, you can't determine grade for anything besides mast cell tumors. I just read a paper this morning um, called Value, Limitations, and Recommendations for Grading of Canine Cutaneous Mast Cell Tumors, a Consensus of the Oncology, Oncology Pathology Working Group. Just read that this morning, and I found out that, in fact, uh, cytology is fairly accurate for predicting grade um, with mast cell tumors, but only mast cell tumors. Remember that you may just detect fat surrounding a malignancy and some tumors don't exfoliate. That's what this is supposed to say. All right, so this is a typical lipoma. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's probably actually histopath on a lipoma. Now, anybody recognize this tumor down here in the photo? So this is obviously a lipoma, but it is an intermuscular lipoma that happens in the back leg of dogs. And what you see typically is these dogs present with a big fat thigh and you're thinking, oh, it's got some terrible sarcoma, I better amputate the leg. What you should do is take a radiograph of it because you'll see a big fat bubble in the middle of the thigh. And these are actually quite easy to manage. You just make that incision on the caudal thigh, separate your semimembranosus and semitendinosus, and then put all your instruments away and dissect it out with your fingers because the sciatic nerve is gonna be right in the middle of that mass. And um, that's, there's been a report of probably 13 or 15 cases of these by Maureen Thompson, and she found um, that the prognosis is actually excellent with these. Um, and, and all we do is just digital dissection, carefully peeling it off the sciatic nerve. So uh, again, big fat thigh, take a radiograph. Um, you'll see that big uh, fat bubble in the middle of the muscles and uh, you can do this marginal excision and they do well. So this is your typical mast cell tumor cytology. So your granules, some of them don't, uh, the granules don't stain very well. And so you might have to send them off for toluene blue um, analysis by your pathologist, but it's still generally, it's pretty easy to diagnose a mast cell tumor. And then this is a spindle cell tumor. So we've got our long spindeloid cells here, um, fairly prominent uh, nucleus with a nucleolus and chromatin, uh, dense chromatin pattern within the, uh, within the nucleus. All right, so when you do your incisional biopsy, you wanna plan your final surgery and then put the biopsy incision in a place that it can be easily removed. And I, I, there's a big risk if you don't do that. And the next slide will show that. You want the incision to be parallel to the lines of tension so that it's easy to excise. And generally both the center of the tumor and junctional tissue is a safe practice. And the reason why you wanna get the center and junctional tissue is because with for example, soft tissue sarcomas and mast cell tumors, you want that junctional tissue so that the pathologist can get an idea of the extent of invasion into surrounding tissues, which is gonna give you an idea of grade um, and invasiveness. Whereas like for a, a osteosarcoma, if you don't get the middle of the tumor, you're just gonna get reactive bone on the periphery. So generally you wanna get both the, the center and the junctional tissue on the margin. And so uh, this was the, the slide that I was talking about, in one study in humans, 30% of humans presented to a tertiary referral center for limb salvage surgery had to have their limbs amputated because of inappropriately placed biopsy incisions. And I'm sure that that's the case in veterinary medicine as well. So you wanna really think about your definitive surgery, put your biopsy tract in a place that you can remove with a definitive surgery. Um, pardon my terrible pun, but a farewell to arms uh, was the reference that I had. Uh, that I put there. If, if uh, you're not aware, this is this whole uh, lecture has a cinematic theme, um, so movies. Um, so incisional biopsy or, or excisional biopsy. So if you're thinking about doing an excisional biopsy, meaning that you're treating based on a guess, there are a couple of questions that I want you to answer to yourself um, before you do that. All right. So um, when when you're treating based on a guess you're assuming either you're assuming that it's worst case scenario and you're doing a surgery that may be too big for the patient or you're doing you're you're underdosing surgery because you're actually treating something more aggressive aggressive than you're guessing and so you're really much better off finding out what you're treating before you try to do an excision on it all right what about drains generally don't use them okay 
and especially with cancer surgery. Now, if we go and try to do an excision, so let's say we got a dirty margin and we're gonna to wanna to go in and remove this entire surgical scar, the size of the excision we're gonna to have to take is much larger because these drain tracks are here. There's no reason to drain this tumor. And certainly if all you're doing is a biopsy, you definitely don't need to drain them. And if you are going to use a drain, please don't use a Penrose drain, use a closed section drain. And those of you that watch my videos on YouTube and have heard me lecture before, you know that I don't own Penrose drains. We don't have them in our practice. I don't believe that they're appropriate in any case. The only exception might be for cat bite abscesses, which I don't treat very many of, but I still think you'd be better off with a closed section drain or not draining it at all. Once you get rid of the foreign body and flush out the infection, you really don't need to be draining abscesses. All right, um, so this is an example of a mammary gland tumor that has recurrence after a, a partial mastectomy. So this is the excision that we would have to do um, without a drain. If you imagine that drains are put in, that's the excision that we'd have to do in order to get the whole thing out. So very big difference in the extent of the surgery that we'd have to do. And I have seen some cases that have come in where a second surgery is not possible because of the drain that was drains that were placed previously. So we're talking about either an amputation or you know, euthanasia, you know, that kind of thing. So really, you know, if you're using drains, really question in your mind why you're using a drain and really second guess yourself and think maybe I shouldn't be using one. All right, so general principles for um, biopsies, put in a great history um, and sometimes even send digital photographs to your pathologist because number one, you want the pathologist to be engaged in a patient. And what could be more boring than sitting there staring at microscope slides all day um, at your desk and any connection that you could make between that patient and you know, in that microscope slide and that patient, you're gonna get a better job from your pathologist. If the diagnosis doesn't fit the patient, call the pathologist. And if the pathologist won't talk to you, get a new pathologist. Um, we frequently talk to our pathologist, um, you know, almost daily uh, to get clarification on biopsy results. And they also know that they have a good relationship with us. So they'll call us when they get biopsies and say, look, just this, this doesn't make sense. You said that this was a, a tumor on the extremity, but it looks like it's a transmissible venereal tumor. Why is that, you know, why is that there? And so you might get a clarification that, oh, that was another patient that we had on the same day. Maybe the pathology samples got mixed up, whatever. So make sure that you've got that really open dialogue with your pathologist um, and you'll get better biopsy results and, uh, and you'll get a pathologist that's more engaged in your patients. All right, so when we get our histopath back, there are a few things that we wanna answer. So there's four questions that you wanna answer when you get your pathology back from uh, from histopath. Number one, is it a tumor or not? So is it a cancer or is it an infectious process? Something like that. Number two, what's the histological diagnosis? Soft tissue sarcoma, chondrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, um, because histological diagnosis is, is going to help us predict the best treatment and also the prognosis. What's the grade, if relevant? And note that with most tumor types, they have a grading scale now identified, certainly soft tissue sarcomas, mast cell tumors, osteosarcomas, melanomas, even hemangiosarcoma, um, so many different tumor types, grade is relevant. And if a pathologist doesn't give you a grade, call them up and ask them and say, look, I think that there's a grading scale for soft tissue sarcomas. Can you please try to give me a, um, uh, what your perception of the grade is? Because that's gonna give you a better opportunity um, to have a discussion with the owners that is more educated. Um, and then if you've done an excisional biopsy, you wanna know if your margins are clean or dirty. <clears throat> All right, so the biopsy came back, fibrosarcoma grade two. So we get a biopsy result back. Next thing we wanna do is a literature review. And when we do a literature review, um, ultimately we wanna use evidence-based journal articles as the source for our decision-making. We don't wanna use previous experience. We don't wanna use impressions, anecdotes, we want hard evidence in order to make um, treatment recommendations. And unfortunately, journal articles, um, you know, you'd have to read probably just to keep up with cancer literature, you'd have to read 2000 articles a year. Um, if you wanted to keep up with orthopedics and soft tissue and vaccination re regimes and deworming protocols and stuff like that, you'd have to read 5000 articles a year or something crazy. And so 
we just can't do that. Nobody can keep up with the entire breadth of veterinary knowledge. And so we have to distill that information into other places. Um, number one is textbooks. But just remember that textbooks are about five years out of date the minute that they hit the shelves. Because uh, by, the, you know, by the time you collect the, the chapters from your authors um, and they're submitted and then it's proofread and then you have your galley prints and then the, um, the textbook is actually printed, it takes about five years. They may be improving on that a little bit, but not a lot. And so, uh, you know, if it's something like a soft tissue sarcoma and you're looking for surgical principles, that probably doesn't change that much, but, you know, new stuff is coming out every day with um, you know, chemotherapy and mast cell tumors and radiation therapy and all kinds of stuff. And so it's really hard to keep up and you really want up-to-date information. Hopefully your specialists are going to be up-to-date at least within their field of interest. And our entire business model is made, on, made based on um, relationships with primary care veterinarians. And so as specialists, we're so happy to talk to you about cases, whether you refer them or not. We're just, you know, we're relationship building. We wanna help you uh, manage your cases in-house, whether you refer them to us or not. And so certainly within our hospital, um, you will, um, you'll get a, you know, a return phone call within hours if you have questions about cases. And, and I would say that anywhere in the world that has specialists available, that's going to be the case. And if you're not getting that kind of service from your specialists, I'm sure there are other specialists out there that would be willing to give you that service. And so, you know, same thing, if you call your pathologist, and they won't talk to you, get a new pathologist. If you call your specialist and they won't talk to you, get a new specialist. Um, there's enough competition out there that you can choose. Um, in most geographic areas, um, a specialist that's willing to help you and talk to you on the phone, whether or not that case is being referred. The other one is vin.com. Um, <clears throat> vin is fantastic. You have access to specialists directly by posting questions. You also have um, a lot of abstracts, access to te uh, textbooks, access to uh, proceedings from conferences and things like that. So that's a really great resource uh, for people. I, um, I still use it uh, sometimes. And the other thing is that you can, if you're too shy to post your own cases, you can um, go back and see what other people have posted. And so you're gonna get a lot of responses to your questions. All right, so grade two fibrosarcoma. Um, so when we do our literature review or we're talking to our specialist or we're looking on VIN, there are a couple of questions that you should be asking yourself um, or making sure that you have the answer to them so that you can go back to your client and have an educated discussion with them. Number one, is there a curative dose of surgery? So for lymphoma, for example, for most cases, there's no curative dose of surgery unless it's a very focal case. Um, and so that's a chemotherapy patient in most cases, whereas with soft tissue sarcoma grade one, you know, pretty much all of them we can cure with a good surgery. If a marginal surgery is done, is recurrence likely, number one? And number two, are there adjuvant treatments available for residual disease? So a grade one soft tissue sarcoma with marginal excision on the extremity, I would usually be happy to monitor that to see if it recurs. I don't think often that another treatment is required in many cases. Whereas if I had a grade three soft tissue sarcoma and I did a marginal excision, I can virtually guarantee you that that's going to recur. So that's one that I would be more interested in doing something follow-up like radiation therapy, metronomic chemotherapy, something like that. Are there gender, species, breed, and anatomic variations in tumor behavior? For example, um, with mast cell tumors, cat mast cell tumors um, generally are more benign than dog mast cell tumors. As far as breed's concerned, uh, boxers are, definite, are, are generally more benign than say, for example, Sharpe mast cell tumors. So boxers are usually low grade, Sharpe are usually high grade mast cell tumors. Anatomic variations, for example, mucocutaneous junctions, mast cell tumors are more aggressive than they are on the skin. So for example, if you have one in the mouth or on the prepuce or on the vulva, that's gonna be a higher grade tumor, more aggressive than uh, one that occurs just on the skin somewhere. Gender. For example, ma uh, mammary gland tumors are rare in male dogs, but when they happen, they're really, really aggressive. So you wanna know all this information so you know what kind of picture to paint for your client. What's the likelihood of metastasis? So grade one soft tissue sarcoma in the extremity never metastasizes. I can tell you that with virtually 100% confidence. I've never seen one spread. 
whereas a grade three soft tissue sarcoma has about a 50% chance of metastasis. Where are metastatic lesions likely to appear? Well, with a oral melanoma, it's likely to go to the lymph nodes and maybe lungs. With an oral, um, uh, or say for example, a melanoma that's on the nail bed, it's likely to go to the lymph nodes. If you have a soft tissue sarcoma, it's more likely to go to the lungs. Osteosarcoma is lungs and other bones. Mast cell tumors are lymph nodes, spleen, liver, and bone marrow. So it's different for every case. And that's gonna dictate where you're gonna look when you're doing the staging. Has chemotherapy been shown to improve survival? There's only a handful of tumor types where chemotherapy has been shown to help. Um, lymphoma, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, melanoma, multiple myeloma, transitional cell carcinoma, that's pretty much all that I can think of, maybe feline injection site sarcomas. There aren't a thousand of them that, that, that it's been shown to be helpful for, it's just a handful. Oh, anal sac adenocarcinoma is the other one. Are there perineoplastic syndromes that are going to dictate prognosis and also uh, give you other things to look out for? For example, with anal sac adenocarcinomas, you have hypercalcemia. If you have a hypercalcemic patient, that predicts a poor prognosis. And also you're gonna to wanna to look at the kidneys pretty carefully because a dog that's been hypercalcemic for a while can have kidney damage. Um, insulinomas, obviously you have hypoglycemia. Can anybody think of another tumor for which uh, you might have hypoglycemia? Anything come to mind on the chat? <clears throat> so abdominal lyomyomas and lyomyosarcomas um, or sarcomas in general intra-abdominally can have hypoglycemia as a perineoplastic syndrome. Uh, lymphoma and hypercalcemia is the other one that we see. All right, so staging. When we're staging, we're determining the regional and systemic extent of the tumor. All right, so staging, remember there's a big difference between stage and grade. Stage is the systemic and regional extent of the tumor, all the lymph nodes positive, are the lungs positive, what's the size of the tumor, things like that. And grade is purely a histological diagnosis. It's purely based on biopsy. Um, so in order to do staging, often we'll do things like lymph node aspirates, we'll do chest imaging, um, and these are based on our literature review. So am I going to do a lymph node aspirate in an ec extremity soft tissue sarcoma? Probably not. Am I going to do a lymph node aspirate for a grade three mast cell tumor on the extremity? Yes, definitely. Um, am I going to do chest x-rays on a mast cell tumor? Probably not. Um, I mean, it's not a terrible idea, but I've never seen one spread to the parenchyma of the lungs. Um, when we're doing chest imaging, radiographs are great. You wanna do three view chest x-rays because you can definitely increase your sensitivity. And if you have CT scan available, um, CT scan is much more sensitive than x-rays for picking up metastases. Sometimes we'll do a CT scan of the leg to look at extent of invasion and how close it is to, for example, the femoral artery or the sciatic nerve, something like that. All right, so this is an uh, aspirate of the lymph node. We have a, a um, large variation in the size of the lymph lymphocytes. So we've got little tiny mature lymphocytes here and more lymphoblastic looking ones here. So this is a normal reactive lymph node. All right, I don't see any mast cells. I don't see any melanin granules, anything like that. So this is generally a, a normal lymph node aspirate. Uh, this is a thoracic radiograph where we've got multiple metastatic lesions. Um, this was a case that had a hemangiosarcoma um, and we were going to take it to surgery for a splenectomy, but we took chest x-rays first, which is what you should always do. Um, and that showed multiple metastatic lesions. So it didn't make sense to take this patient to surgery to do a splenectomy. Um, this is a chest CT scan. This is actually a human um, with a metastatic lesion in the lung. We can pick up metastatic lesions down to about two millimeters in diameter on a chest CT scan. So it is definitely more sensitive than, a, than an X-ray is. All right, so um, the next step in staging is looking for regional extent of the tumor. So we're gonna look at tumor size because size can be prognostic in some tumor types, particularly oral melanomas, thyroid carcinomas, anal sac adenocarcinomas, size is uh, osteosarcoma, size is predictive or prognostic for all of those tumor types. How attached is it? When you move this tumor, does the whole dog move or does the skin move independent of the leg? So that's gonna dictate or help you predict what kind of surgery is gonna be required in order to get a clean margin. 
You want to look at anatomic considerations, big structures with short names, like the um, sciatic nerve that's lying underneath here. I've heard of saying, don't cut anything you know the name of. Um, so uh, uh, as long, you know, as long as, or, or uh, only if you're fully aware of the anatomy and what the ramifications are in cutting those structures. This is a 3D volume rendering of a CT scan. So we've got a thyroid carcinoma sitting right here. We've got carotid artery running alongside of it. We've got jugular vein branching into the lingua or to the uh, maxillary and lingual facial veins down here, uh, facial vein, lingual vein. We've got the hyoid apparatus down here and a tracheal tube. So it, it really feels like you're cheating when you've got 3D volume rendering on a CT scan. Remember that a lot of your specialists are happy to do CT scans for you, even if you're not sending the case for surgery. You send the CT, to the patient to them for a CT and then get it back and you can operate on it based on the results of the CT scan. Remember that in G human GP or general practices, they don't have a CT scan in every practice. They send you out for a CT. So remember that your specialists are very happy to provide that service in most cases. This is another uh, thyroid carcinoma. So we've got the carotid artery here, the lingual facial, the facial lingual maxillary veins here, salivary glands here, hyoid apparatus, uh, carotid artery is sitting right down in here. So it's just amazing the detail that we can get with these 3D volume renderings. Uh, this was a carotid body tumor, not resectable in this patient, um, but it just again shows you the detail. We've got the mandibular salivary gland here, parotid gland up here, jugular vein, maxillary vein, facial vein, lingual vein, carotid artery sitting right here, hyoid apparatus down here. And so this tumor was really compacted up behind the, um, the pharynx and originating from the carotid body in the neck. <clears throat> All right, so we've done our biopsy. We find out what the tumor is, what the grade is. We've done our literature review to find out how it behaves. We've done our staging to see where it is in the dog. Now we're gonna go back to the client and have another discussion with them and paint a picture of what, um, what the patient has in store for them. So what questions or what things are we gonna discuss with the owner? Can I do a curative intent surgery? That's the number one thing. Can I do a curative intent surgery short of an amputation? If I can't do a curative intent surgery short of an amputation, can somebody else do a curative intent surgery short of an amputation? Um, and then if a curative intent surgery cannot be done, is there an adjuvant treatment that will reduce recurrence? And for, for example, soft tissue sarcomas and mast cell tumors, there's definitely adjuvant treatments that you can do for those to prevent recurrence after an incomplete surgery. All right, so when we do cancer surgery, I'm sure that you guys who have seen me lecture before have seen this slide. Basically, in human surgery, particularly with maxillofacial surgery, they have two different teams. They have the resection team and the reconstruction team. Resection team goes in and takes out everything that they need to to get a clean margin. The reconstruction team then comes in and puts everything back together. And you, you, because we don't have that luxury in veterinary medicine, you have to divide your brain in half. So when you walk into theater, you want to first put your resection team hat on and make sure that you do everything that you need to do to get, get that clean margin. And you're not worrying about how you're gonna close it when you're resecting it or you're gonna leave cancer behind. Then the reconstruction team comes in and does whatever they have to do to put it back together. The time to chicken out is before you walk into theater, not while you're cutting because you're gonna leave cancer behind. And so when you're thinking, how am I gonna put this back together? You want to have thought about all those different options before you ever walked into theater. You don't wanna be stuck here and thinking, I'm gonna to have to leave this to, uh, open to heal by second intention because that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> okay, this is a cat. We've taken nine ribs out for an injection site sarcoma. And so I know cats have very elastic skin. I know that I've got polypropylene mesh um, that I can put in and reconstruct the thoracic wall, and I know that the skin is gonna to close together um, very nicely. If this was a dog, I'd have to come up with a completely different plan because dogs don't have that elastic skin. So this is the time before you walk into theaters to think about how you're gonna put things back together. All right, so we can dose surgery just like we can dose antibiotics. Imagine that we've got a tumor sitting here the least aggressive surgery that we could do is called cytoreductive surgery. And that means that grossly visible tumor is going to remain. That's generally a bad idea. If you find yourself doing cytoreductive or debulking surgery, 
really question to yourself whether you're doing the patient any good. I never do cytoreductive surgery. Okay, I can honestly say that I haven't done one in 10 years, I don't think. Um, because what happens is that you're leaving the most aggressive cancer cells behind, and those are gonna recur very, very quickly. They're gonna bleed excessively because the, the blood vessels don't have smooth muscle in them, and so they're not gonna clot properly, they're not gonna um, uh, constrict properly, and so you're gonna have a big bloody mass. So really, <clears throat> you should not be doing cytoreductive surgery. Marginal surgery is when we're leaving microscopic tumor behind. And that's appropriate for benign tumors like lipomas, uh, like um, perianal adenomas, like parathyroid adenomas, but inappropriate for malignant tumors like mast cell tumors and certainly intermediate or high-grade soft tissue sarcomas because they're going to come back in most cases unless you treat the bed with something else. So if you're doing marginal surgery with anything except for grade one soft tissue sarcomas, and adenomas and, and lipomas and things like that, you're going to get recurrences. So you have to think about what you're gonna to do to prevent recurrence. <clears throat> and then the best thing to do is wide local excision where the tumor capsule is never entered. And, uh, and so this is what we do with our grade one, or sorry, grade two and three soft tissue sarcomas, even some of our grade one soft tissue sarcomas, mast cell tumors, um, uh, anal sac adenocarcinomas, things like that. So you wanna make sure that you're completely staying out of the capsule. Now with Maverick, what are our treatment options? So the least, uh, so there's a saying, good surgical judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from poor surgical judgment. I have a lot of experience. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. And so my hope is that I can drag you guys along and not, and, and you don't have to make the same mistakes that I have. And so that's, again, we're coming, we're going to somebody else who's made all the mistakes before and asking them before you do the surgery can be really helpful. So um, just a quick note about amputation. Note that amputation should be an option for, um, you know, for most animals. And I've done probably a thousand large breed dog amputations. I've had three dogs that haven't done well after surgery. All of them had significant neurologic disease going into it. And there was a study that was done retrospectively talking to clients of pets that had, had amputations and 92% were extremely happy with the result. And I think another 6% were happy with the result of the surgery. And so really don't rule out amputation, even in your large and giant breed dogs, they do learn to walk again and they can do quite well. Sorry about that, another dad joke. Um, all right, so um, wide local excision is clearly our best option. So if um, uh, you have a soft tissue sarcoma or a mast cell tumor or whatever, and you do a wide local excision, uh, this statistic is specific for soft tissue sarcomas. You have 5% chance of recurrence in five years with clean surgical margins. Okay, so that's always our best choice. How are we gonna close this? Well, what are our options? Could we do a thoracodorsal axial pattern flap? That's a good one. Lateral thoracic, sure. Um, superficial brachial, possibly. Um, I think I attempted primary closure on this and it fell apart miserably. That's what it looked like after about 12 weeks. Okay, this is the same patient. If you don't believe me, look at those pigment markings there on the leg. Okay, this is 12 weeks out, just leaving it open to heal by second intention. It is amazing how dogs and cats can heal by second intention. Okay, another one that I've had removed, this is a carpal soft tissue sarcoma. I took out extensor tendons, joint capsule, everything, got a clean margin on it, and this healed completely by second intention. Okay, how many of you would be brave enough to do that? So surgical oncology is not necessarily about surgical skill. It's just about having the guts to take out what you know you need to in order to get a, a cure. Okay, and this is a lot of trial and error, although I have to say, um, you know, ra rarely have I seen cases that I've left open to heal by second intention, not come back and heal completely. All right, so this is a, another patient. We've got our pre-surgical biopsy here. 
and we're doing wide local excision. Now on the antibrachium and also on the hind limb, you have this really nice dense fascia that's gonna act as a great barrier to tumor penetration. And so by taking that fascia out, that's gonna be your deep plane or your deep margin. And so you just have to do a couple of centimeters out in all directions and then take your antibrachial fascia or your crural fascia out as your deep margin. And you'll, you'll, um, uh, you're gonna get a, a cure on these patients virtually 100% of the time. Now I know that, uh, how many of you know Julius Liptak? Um, so Julius has a Facebook page and he, he presents a lot of cases um, like this and he does more marginal excisions than I do on soft tissue sarcomas of the extremities. And the reason why I don't do that is that with marginal excision, even on grade one soft tissue sarcomas, you're still gonna have 10% of them recur um, as a pure number. So if you did 100 of them, you'd have 10 of them come back. And if you extend that out over, out over time, with time correction on a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, you're gonna have 30% of dogs still alive at the end of the study recurring. So if my surgical oncologist came to me and said, look, I can do a surgery and there's a 30% chance that it's gonna be back if you live another 10 years, I don't know that I would be happy with that recommendation. And so I tend to be more aggressive about these. I know that some people tend to be more conservative and then just recut them if they recur. That's two different schools of thought. Again, I tend to be more aggressive with these. So this is uh, our surgical excision. We've got that nice antibrachial fascia right here. We've got it on the deep surface of the tumor. And so that's gonna be a great barrier to tumor penetration. Um, I've operated on hundreds of dogs with wide local excision leaving them open to heal by second intention. And I've had one recur that we recut and that dog is still cancer free. So that's virtually 100% cure on these patients with, with antibrachial tumors. So what if you do a marginal excision? So do a wide local excision, you have a 95% chance of a local cure. Marginal excision, generally they're gonna come back with anything except for very low grade <clears throat> antibrachial soft tissue sarcomas. So options for or following marginal excision, if you just manage them conservatively and take the wait and see approach, you'll have a 30 to 80% recurrence following marginal excisions of soft tissue sarcomas in five years. And that's not good enough for me. Okay, I'm not happy with that. Um, that because recurrence uh, generally predicts an early death. They're either gonna be euthanized or they're gonna die due to recurrent disease. All right, so radiation therapy is an option. Um, that drops that 75 or, or 30 to 80% down to 20 to 25% recurrence in five years. Acceptable side effects, you're talking about when we do it, 15 to 17 daily treatments. Cost at our practice is about 5,500 to 6,000. Um, our radiation uh, therapy machine is an old orthovoltage machine. It's not the newest technology, but it's still very effective for cleaning up dirty margins on mast cell tumors and and soft tissue sarcomas. It's the same unit that's still being used in about 40 different centers in humans in Australia. And this says we found a mass. The ma good news is we have weapons of mass destruction. All right, metronomic chemotherapy. This is only for incompletely excised soft tissue sarcomas. Drops the recurrence rate from the 30 to 80% down to about 20% in five years. So that's as good as radiation therapy for soft tissue sarcomas. It's administered basically now the protocol is every 48 hours for the life of the dog. Low frequency of side effects, but it can be expensive. And that expense is cumulative over time because it has to be done for life. It's something that I'd be more likely to do in a 12 year old dog than I would be in a five year old dog. Okay, in a five year old dog, I'd be much more likely to push for radiation therapy or another surgery, whereas a 12-year-old dog, I might be more likely to either monitor it or treat with proxicam and cyclophosphamide. Now, the big side, uh, side effect that we see with um, cyclophosphamide is hemorrhagic cystitis, and that is really nasty. The good news is that the majority of patients, it's going to resolve if you discontinue the medication. So if you have a dog that does develop hemorrhagic cystitis, you might consider uh, uh, discontinuing that medication and thinking about something like uh, repeat surgery or radiation therapy. Um, remember that Proxicam can be kidney toxic, and so you are going to want to monitor blood work um, in these patients every month for th three months, and then every three months 
for a year and then every six months after that. All right, so we wanna make sure that we mark and assess our surgical margin. So that's our, I believe it's our seventh step. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our tumor, cell, our tumor sample and we're gonna paint the entire surgical margin with black India ink. Okay, so paint that entire surgical margin. And if the pathologist sees cancer cells touching the inked margin, you know that you've got a positive or dirty margin. And dirty margins do predict recurrence in a lot of different tumor types. So what do you do if you get dirty margins? You could take the wait and see approach. Again, you're looking at the 30 to 80% um, recurrence rate. You could recut. Now recutting is your best option for dirty margins. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna treat that entire surgical scar as a new tumor. So we're gonna get two to three centimeter margins around that entire surgical scar. And I have gotten 100% clean margins on recuts for soft tissue sarcomas and 0% recurrence. Okay, so if you recut a soft tissue sarcoma, um, and remember that that's dictated by whether you can recut it or not. Like, is it, is it anatomically feasible? But if you can recut it, that's your best option. And so this is what it looks like when we did a recut. And we did a genicular axial pattern flap on that patient. Incidentally, if you're interested in axial pattern flaps, we do have a whole vet dojo module dedicated to that. Um, it's www.vetdojo.com, V-E-T. D-O-J-O, -O. I go through all the axial pattern, axial pattern flaps. I've got videos, how to select one for which anatomic site, pitfalls, how to improve your success rate, things like that. Uh, this is another soft tissue sarcoma on the side of a dog. All right, so I've got this little lump sitting right here and I did not have a CT scanner at my disposal at that time. This would have been about 20 years ago. And so I could palpate this thing and see that it was fairly fixed to the underlying tissues. And so I knew that I was gonna to have to do a pretty aggressive surgery. So number one, I went wide. So I went four centimeters on this tumor because I've got lots of room. I'm on the flank of a dog. So I've got lots of room, lots of uh, anatomy to work with. And that went all the way down through the body wall. And you might think that that's overkill, but when you look at the underside of the tumor sample, that's the inside of the abdominal wall. And that's the tumor poking through right there. If I had done anything less than full thickness body wall, that tumor would have been uh, incompletely excised and it would have recurred. All right, and this closed primarily. We had lots of extra skin here. Uh, if there was a concern about tension, I could use a flank fold flap coming from the front of the leg. That would have worked really well here. All right, so this is an antibrachial soft tissue sarcoma. Look at the size of that thing. What am I gonna do? Wide local excision. Okay, that's almost 360 degrees around and that healed completely by second intention. How many of you would have guessed that that would have healed by second intention? Okay, I've just really started pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope on these things and they all healed. We published 31 cases of soft tissue sarcomas of the antibrachium, all treated with wild local excision and left open to heal by second intention. 100% clean margins, 100% local control and um, two cases required a skin graft. 29 out of the 31 healed completely by second intention. All right, radiation therapy. We talked about that late, uh, previously, but radiation therapy, these are typical acute side effects. So what you're gonna see is moist desquamation of the skin. It's uncomfortable, but it's not terrible. Okay, I have rarely, if ever had patients or clients that have refused continuing with treatment because of the development of side effects. This is a dog that had nasal um, uh, adenocarcinoma, and you can see that sometimes the fur grows back a different color. We have white dogs come back with black mohawks, um, all kinds of things. So, but obviously it's not of any concern to the clients. Um, they are hairless probably for about a year. All right, so there are four situations where the surgeon recognizes that complete excision cannot be or was not achieved. Very, very important slide here. Those times are before surgery, during surgery, when the biopsy results come back dirty, and when the tumor recurs. What's the best time to discover that a complete excision cannot be or was not achieved is before you ever walk into theater. All right, this is a case that I saw, this was an amelanotic melanoma, and I knew that getting a complete margin on this is gonna be challenging. 
Not only that, but it has a high chance of metastasis. I opted for just palliative radiation in this case. This is one when we're, we're cutting into the tumor or cutting what you think is cutting around the tumor, but you realize you're cutting into the tumor. You get what's called the oh shit phenomenon, where in the middle of surgery, you realize that you're getting a dirty margin. What you need to do there is either close this incision and go wider with new instruments and new gloves, or go ahead and do your marginal excision and recognize that you're gonna to have to follow up with radiation therapy or metronomic chemo or something like that. If this happened to me during surgery, I would be calling the client in the middle of surgery and saying, look, we cut into tumor. I'm not gonna get a clean margin. What do you wanna do? Do you want to go ahead and continue and then follow with radiation therapy? Do you wanna continue, follow up with metronomic chemotherapy? Do you wanna continue and just see what happens? Or do you want to close it up and then do a more aggressive surgery, which may or may not be an amputation? A note on that, I rarely amputate dogs' limbs for soft tissue sarcomas. And the reason is that they never metastasize. And so um, even if I do a marginal excision and it recurs, you can always amputate later on. So I, I am reluctant nowadays to amputate extremities for soft tissue sarcomas, particularly low and intermediate grade. If it was a high grade soft tissue sarcoma, I might, I might amputate it just for fear of metastasis. This is one where we see tumor cells touching ink. So we've got that uh, blue India ink on the surface of the tumor and we've got tumor cells going right down to the ink. And so the pathologist is gonna call this a dirty margin. And this is one where we've got a previous surgical scar here and then the tumor has recurred along that surgical scar. We're gonna treat that whole incision and recurrent tumor as a new tumor and get two to three centimeter margins around that whole thing. All right, chemotherapy, is it indicated? So this is our last step in our um, checklist. Um, so is it indicated? And that's gonna be based on your literature review. Remember that it generally slows uh, or, uh, or slows um, metastasis, but it rarely is curative. Okay, so you'll often get an increase in disease-free interval. So with osteosarcoma, mangiosarcoma, anal sac adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, uh, that sort of thing. But if you're pulling out the chemo, it's rarely going to be curative. You're increasing survival time, but you have to be clear with your clients that often they're still going to, you know, this is still, the tumor is still going to rear its ugly head in the lungs or lymph nodes sometime down the road. Now, chemotherapy can also be used to slow or prevent local recurrence only with soft tissue sarcomas using the metronomic chemotherapy. Um, there may be some benefit in preventing recurrence of mast cell tumors with chemotherapy, although the, uh, the jury is still out on that. So this is a, a CT scan of a dog with multiple nodules within the lung fields. All right, um, and I'll skip this. All right, so just in summary, as a review, let me just move this out of the way here. All right, so the first thing, we've got our mass detected. We've had our conversation with the owners. We're gonna do a biopsy. We're gonna do staging. And staging is both local, regional, and systemic. Systemic staging, why would we do blood work? Just because often they're older patients, but also looking for perineoplastic syndromes. We're gonna consider doing imaging of the chest to look for secondary spread, that chest imaging can be either radiographs or CT scan. You might be looking at the abdomen to look for metastasis of mast cell tumors or anal sac adenocarcinomas. That can be either CT or ultrasound. Generally, radiographs are not particularly sensitive for picking up abdominal metastasis unless you saw a huge sublumbar lymph node on a lateral radiograph. Um, looking for abnormalities, we would consider further investigation, maybe definitive treatment. Now, what if we decided not to do any of this staging and just went straight to definitive treatment? Would the results of this staging change the owner's willingness to treat or would it change um, the treatment that we're going to administer? If we're not doing staging, we're gonna to have to treat it as the most aggressive tumor it could possibly be, okay? And assume that the owners are happy with that and that you're happy to do that, that surgery. So as far as definitive treatment is concerned, we talk about doing surgery 
And that's usually, or that's the most effective treatment for almost any kind of cancer with the exception of like lymphoma, multiple myeloma, things like that. When we do our surgery, we're gonna check our surgical margins. If we get dirty margins, we're gonna think about doing some kind of adjuvant th therapy, either radiation therapy, recut, or metronomic chemotherapy if it's a soft tissue sarcoma. Um, you can do it in the opposite order. So we could do definitive treatment in the form of radiation therapy first, and then following up with surgery. Although I personally don't like operating on irradiated skin because you have issues with wound healing and that kind of thing. You have to wait two months. Um, but there is physiologically some benefit to doing radiation therapy first because of issues of tissue hypoxia and stuff like that. Basically, you've heard the saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so radiation oncologists like to do radiation first. Surgeons like to do surgery first. And then we're going to consider doing chemotherapy as well based on our literature review if there's been a benefit in survival demonstrated. All right, so big questions. Can you do a surgery that will be curative? And that, you know, you have to, it's almost like the heavens part and the light shines down on you and you say, yes, I'm going to cure this patient. And if you're not going to, then you need to really either have a, a very frank discussion with the owners or you need to really think about the surgery, that, the type of surgery that you're doing and whether it's going to be effective. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a challenge going forward, and that is to use the 10 commandments in every patient you treat with cancer. Okay, the times that I screw up is when I deviate from these 10 commandments, and that's when I find myself leaving dirty margins or, or um, having recurrence or uh, discovering metastasis two weeks down the road when I thought I was dealing with a benign tumor. Okay, so I'm going to end my screen share. We're right on an hour, so that's great. Do you guys have any questions for me about anything that we've discussed? You can either unmute yourself or uh, let me just see um, if I can unmute people. Mute all, allow participants to. Okay, so you can unmute yourself or you can post questions on the chat. I'll wait for a couple of minutes. And if you have any questions and then otherwise, we will see you in a few weeks. Any chip, uh, tips or tricks for managing these big open antibrachial wounds? So when we manage these antibrachial wounds, we're going to be bandaging them with a non-adherent bandage. And we're going to change that bandage every three days until we get granulation tissue um, forming. And then we're going to go to every five to six days. I don't personally believe in gooping with any kind of ointment or honey or anything like that. I like dry bandages. And interestingly, there was a study that was done that showed that on sterile wounds, Manuka honey delays wound healing. That was done by Bryden Stanley at Michigan State University. So Manuka honey delays wound healing in sterile wounds. That does not mean necessarily that it doesn't help you with infected wounds, but with sterile wounds, it does not help. Okay, so I just use a non-adherent bandage, uh, modified Robert Jones, change it every two to three days until I get good healthy granulation tissue. And then I'm gonna change it every five to six days until it heals. You're looking at about six to 12 weeks for those to heal completely. And you'll be just shocked at the size of wounds that'll go on and heal on their own. Any other questions or comments about that? About anything else? Would you ever leave mammary neoplasia to heal by second intention? I'd probably try to close it primarily, but if I couldn't get it to close, then, you know, like if I had a failed closure or something like that, then leaving it open to heal by second intention would be my next choice. Um, luckily with the mammary chain, you do have an a lot of options for reconstruction, like the flank fold flap uh, or the axillary fold flap. And so usually we can get those closed. Um, and there's a question about, um, uh, these rounds are recorded, so yes, they are, and I'll put it up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, which is Southpaws Vet. I'll put the name of the YouTube channel in the chat. And just make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, because if you're new to the whole, the, uh, the whole system, I often live stream surgeries where I wear a headset and you guys can ask me questions while I'm operating. Okay, any other questions, concerns? Anything? 
All right. Well, thank you very much for watching. I'll try to get back to you in two weeks. I'm not sure where I will be or if I'll be available, but we are trying to increase the frequency of, uh, of these rounds since I've been able to come off clinics for one day a week. So anyway, I hope everybody has a good week and a good weekend, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you.